Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking movies, TV, comics, and more. Join in the conversation on our social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome back to another edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What is going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him, the Star Wars expert of the ODPH panel himself, the one and only Padawan J. Hello there. Folks, we have a lot to discuss this week in the land of movies, TV, comics, and more. So definitely join in that conversation on social media. You can find all our accounts and so much more at OchoDuroParleyHour.com. And always remember, use the hashtag ODPH. And like we said, we have a lot to discuss this week. But no bigger story than this past week's Mandalorian episode. Number 5 of Season 2 or Chapter 13, The Jedi. Directed and written by the one and only Dave Filoni. Mm-hmm. I guess he's kind of a good deal. Uh, yeah, kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal in his own right. So we are going to be talking spoilers because there's a lot to digest with this episode. Mm-hmm. So you have been forewarned. If you haven't seen it for whatever reason, I don't want to know the deal. I can't deal I with do. it right Why the fuck have you not watched it? Some people they haven't seen it. And I'm not going to judge you about this. That's true. I, I'm just going to say you have been forewarned because we are deep diving into this and breaking down a lot because this episode warrants it. This entire podcast episode. So we are giving you fair warning now. Three, two, one. Pad, what did you think? Ahsoka lives. Okay, wait. We already knew that, but still, it was really awesome to finally see her on the you know TV screen again. You know, the last time we saw her was the season. Se- excuse me, not season. Uh, series finale of Star Wars Rebels uh, a couple years ago. Uh, so it been a little bit of a dry spell. I know there was a novel in there. You know that kind of took place. Uh, after the end of uh, Clone Wars, you know, kind of what she was doing, but. It, it's kind of been all quiet on the Ahsoka front, so it was nice to finally see her. I was a little, you know, trepidatious. How is this going to work? This is a character I've seen, you know, only in animated form. How is this going to look? You know, how am, am I going to be okay with this? It lived up to my expectations, and holy shit, this episode had some information. This episode might have been the most important Mandalorian episode ever. Uh huh. It might be. It's it, this whole season has just been a surefire can't miss. Must watch. Uh huh. We've been deep diving into it each and every week, and for good reason, because the Mandalorian has delivered on all fronts. This though was the proverbial cherry on the Sunday, because oh, I yeah. I honestly don't know how you top this unless you get Boba Fett back his armor and then he has a face off with said Mandalorian. You're I don't save know. that for season three. You could save it for season three right now because I don't know if I can mentally handle it. But this episode had so much mm-hmm. going on. It's dominated social media. We have to go deep dive into it because we finally pick up the story where the Mandalorian and the child, for now, that's what we know him as, Mm -hmm. finally is making its way to the planet Corvus, where it's been located uh, that there is a Jedi that will help them raise the child, reunite him with his own species. And as we start coming to that planet, we do find out that not everything is what it seems. Right. We do see that there is somebody by the name of Morgan Elsbeth mm-hmm. who is running the city of Caledon. Yep. That is trying to eliminate a threat. We don't know who this person is, just yep. per se. We just know that her guards are trying to go hunt this person down and eliminate the threat. And during this time, we see one of the best introductions of a character, Barnon. Mm-hmm. Pad. Break it down for us. Ahsoka just comes in and starts opening up a can of whoop ass and taking uh, names and not giving a you know what. Holy crap. I did not expect this. I don't think anybody did. Uh, I figured that it would be almost kind of like uh, how we saw Luke Skywalker at the end of uh, Force Awakens, mm-hmm. where, you know, obviously not in like the last 30 seconds of the episode, but I figured it'd be one of those things like he goes looking for her. Maybe she's hanging out someplace. Who are you? You know, the, I'm, you know, yada, yada. I, I've got this child. I did not expect to see her, like, off the bat, coming in, kicking ass, and taking names. No, Rosario Dawson, who is perfectly cast mm-hmm. in this role, came on the screen and took it over and instantly made everybody erupt with jubilation about yeah. this. She came in, great action sequences, demonstrating what Ahsoka does best, mm-hmm. and that... 
is just truly earning the fan hype that has been surrounding this character since yeah. it was announced that she was going to be joining the show. Because it had been getting leaked out, so we knew it was yep. coming at some point. Yep. And give credit to Pat. He did predict it was going to be this episode as soon as he saw who was connected to it. Because mm-hmm. Dave Filoni has had it, a it, uh, long history and is integral to the creation of Ahsoka. So, you know, why trust anybody else for that, that story than him? Right. So as we see the great introduction with Ahsoka taking out the guards and then disappearing into the the woods, mm-hmm. because we don't exactly know the full backstory at this point. Right. But then we get joined finally by the Mandalorian who finally comes down and is going into town because he's trying to find Ahsoka. Because this is where all the information he's been given thus far in the season that these two are on a collision course to find each other. Mm-hmm. Now, once the Mandalorian makes it into town, he does come across Elsbeth. Yep. And Elsbeth is offering a very unique deal, Mm -hmm. which is, I thought was very interesting on how they set this up. Yeah. Because the Mandalorian is used to bounty hunting. So this was almost like a reflex to take a deal because he needs resources to keep going. He also just burned a thousand credits on a piece of crap uh, fix job on his ship. Right. So what he does is has this meeting with Elsbeth and is offered a spear Mm -hmm. in exchange for eliminating Ahsoka. Yeah. But this is no ordinary spear. What is it made of, Pad? Uh, Beskar. Yes. The sacred metal Mm -hmm. of the Mandalorian. So this is enticing enough to get him interested. Because he could always melt that down and make some more armor. Exactly. So this is a big deal for him and to keep going because obviously he's on a mission. But the target being Ahsoka throws him in a little bit of jeopardy because why is he trying to eliminate her? Yeah. And once they finally have the meetup, which was perfectly played up, Mm -hmm. we get a lot more information. Because when Ahsoka is hiding out in town, the Mandalorian does sneak there and says, I'm supposed to eliminate you, but I'm supposed to bring you the child as well. Right. During this exchange, we had one of the more, I will say for the reaction, it was Mm mind-blowing. But it wasn't really living up to the hype. That's the question I have to ask about this. Because Ahsoka figures out the real name of Baby Yoda mm-hmm. and it is Grogu, mm-hmm. which... Some oh. people are kind of mixed on. I'm, it's Star Wars. I mean, let's face it, one of the big villains in, two, in two-thirds in of the sequel trilogy is two letters away from being called Snape. Yeah. You know, their Star Wars names are weird. They're bizarre. They're odd, but it is what it is. It comes with a territory. Yeah, like, I, yeah. It just took me a while, like, saying, okay, is everybody going to start calling him Grogu? No, they're going to call him Baby yeah. Yoda for yeah. now to the end of time. Like, yeah. like, you can try flipping name on characters, but, like, this is how it was introduced. Everybody knows Baby Yoda yeah. or the child. It's almost like how many AKAs can one character have? Mm-hmm. But then again, look at the hype of the series and the hype of Baby Yoda since it's debuted. Yeah. If you're any involvement with Star Wars fandom... Yeah, you're hooked on this. Uh-huh. So it's not going to matter what you call him because it's going to be the character. But thus, Ahsoka determines the name, drops that bombshell, and then explains about training as a Jedi. She, uh, yeah, Ahsoka brings up that you know he grew up in, in the temple. And, and we could we kind of figured this, or all you might have figured this, because in season one it was mentioned he was 50 years old. And if you look up the Star Wars timeline and do some simple math around the Phantom Menace time, time uh, when he was born. So, you know, I, I kind of figured he trained at the Jedi Temple, but you never know. Uh, you know, they do slip through cracks. Look at Anakin. Right. You know, but then trained many masters. But then uh, she says when the when the Empire rose to power, he was hidden and then taken from the temple. And then his memory becomes foggy. And, the, and that kind of had me wonder, I'm like, who the hell would have taken him? Because the list of Jedi who survived the, the purge is real short. Right. Unless they create a new one, which, okay. Well, I mean, they have that liberty to do because yeah. obviously the Mandalorian, it, I, being in the timeline, you're allowed to kind of yeah. dabble a little bit because it, this is new uncharted water. Mm-hmm. So if they want to add somebody into the mythos, sure, yeah. as long as it makes sense. I'll be it, though, if it's Jar Jar, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there right now. But we do get the story of... Uh, how this is connected to the Clone Wars and how the saga begun there. Mm -hmm. The mystery character, which I'm sure we're going to find out more as the season progresses, is going to be a big factor. Now, could it be somebody else that's added from Rebels? We don't know. Maybe. There's so much area that they can cover with this. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll just have to keep speculating as it goes on. Yeah. But as this story progresses, though, the Mandalorian is explaining how he has to reunite 
Grogu mm-hmm. with his own kind. Yep. And cuts a deal with Ahs- with Ahsoka. Yep. That if he helps defeat Elsbeth yep. for her, that she will continue Grogu's training. Yep. So they have agreed to this. So it's kind of like a weird Western double cross. You help me, I help you. Yeah, because the Mandalorian is, is just making moves on everybody, uh-huh. which, which I love how they brought it back to this. Because yeah. as much as we recognize he's finding a redemption in himself. He's, he's finding a heart and a soul. He's finding something, but yet he's brought back into what he knows best, which is... Cutting deals. Yep. And I love it. Yeah. I absolutely thought they did this great Pedro yeah. Pascal, another knockout performance. So once they start cutting the deal and he's leading the charge back to the guards, he is brought up against a certain bounty hunter who was introduced named Lang. Mm-hmm. So during this time, he's having a standoff because he's trying to free the citizens that are ca- being kept, you want to say almost captive in the city of Kelton, mm-hmm. which is kind of a weird vibe, but you knew something was going on. They didn't elaborate too, yeah. too much. Yeah. But if it's in a guarded castle, it almost kind of had this weird Latvian vibe to it. I had, I had like a Kill Bill, Kill Bill vibe to it. Yeah, like it was something weird about like, it. Like, and I know somebody online made that comparison that like there's a scene in one of the Kill Bills that they almost mirrored identically in this episode where Ahsoka is getting ready to fight, uh, you know, Elsbeth in the in the courtyard scene that it almost like even to the background and just the way it's staged and, and what's there, it almost looked like a damn near replica Kill Bill. Oh yeah, no, you can definitely tell the influence on there. The Kill Bill saga has definitely influenced this episode. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's why I dug it so much, because I, I do love that style of film. So seeing this big standoff and you're having the Western you know pace of who's going to shoot first between the Mandalorian and Lang, but then you also have Ahsoka taking on Elsbeth, which was a wild fight scene, too. Mm-hmm. One of the best they've done. Yeah. Because it wasn't exactly how Ahsoka walked in there and just completely destroyed her. Yeah. No. It was something very unique. It was something we hadn't seen before on, you know, live action. Obviously, it's been done in video games and such. But to this point, we've only ever seen lightsabers that have issue go up with other lightsabers. We've never seen them really go up against something that, like, bounces, you know, the, the saber bounces off or just can't beat. You know, it's always been, oh, yeah, let me just slice this arm off, slice this leg off, and I'm just, you know, working through this like butter. You know, it was really cool to see. No, it was absolutely awesome. And obviously, when you saw Ahsoka's lightsaber go into the water there, because they did have this standoff on like a semi bridge Mm -hmm. of just the the architecture in this was actually another character to this scene. Because I don't think it would have had the stakes being so important and just had that just traditional standoff feel Mm -hmm. that you see in many Westerns and and Kung Fu films. Yeah. Which I absolutely loved. I I can't stress it enough. So as you're having the battle, Ahsoka finally gets the upper hand on Elsbeth, Mm -hmm. and then arguably another bombshell gets dropped. Yeah, didn't see this coming. Would you like the honors, Pad? She goes, where? She well, the entire time she kept going, where's your master, where's your master, where's your master? And I'm going, okay, what is she talking like, Moff Gideon? Is yeah. she talking like another high up in the Imperial? That's who I thought it was. That's what I figured, yeah. Uh, no, she dropped the bombshell of all goddamn Star Wars bombshells. Where's Admiral Thrawn? Yes, which I about shit myself. I admit, Not going to lie. I marked out. I was like, wait. You're introducing because we'll get into this next segment mm-hmm. a little bit, the importance. But hearing that name get brought into this timeline, being acknowledged mm-hmm. was a huge deal. And if you're not familiar, like you said, next segment, we'll kind of get into who he is and, and why it's a big deal. But this isn't a name that you just drop for shock value and move on. No, absolutely he is, not. He has been named for a very specific reason. What that reason is, I don't know. But this isn't a name drop just for, oh, hey, they said, you know, blank. Yeah, exactly. This is going to have rep- ramifications going forward with the show. You thought Moff Gideon was a pain in, a pain in the side? Wait till Thrawn comes. Yeah, this is going to be absolutely incredible to, to go forward with. But the episode, though, kind of wraps up a little bit after that, a little easy, because Mandalorian does take out Lang Mm -hmm. and freeing everybody, so it's almost like that weird happy ending. Yeah. But everything doesn't go as planned, because Ahsoka almost pulls a double cross, almost in this sense, because she refuses to train Grogu, Mm -hmm. because she is sensing that Grogu is so attached to the Mandalorian Mm -hmm. that her training won't do anything for him, even though they, they've come leaps and bounds just from the little time that sure. she's worked with. Sure, but I, but I, and some people might have gone, oh, that stinks, why are you not doing that? But she's drawing off of her experiences, and, and again, we'll get to this next segment, but she's she saw what happened with that with Anakin. 
Yes. So this is going to play a bigger role down the road, too, as well. And, and plus, it makes sense for the show because, obviously, if Ahsoka did train Grogu and they took off, well, what's the Mandalorian going to do? Yeah. The series is over. I'll say it's like, why did why didn't Gilligan's Island, they, they never get off Gilligan's Island? Well, because then the show would have been over. Exactly. If it just if it was that easy, it would just be one and done. Yep. Because you can only tell so many stories because, obviously, you can go in a very different direction if the Mandalorian is by himself yeah. being hunted by the Empire. Because yeah. He's already sunk that battleship, so he's got to just make sure he stays afloat just enough. So I feel like, and then if they if they stick together, you know, Ahsoka with the, the Grogu and then the Mandalorian, then we're getting into like '90s comedy family sitcom territory. Yeah, it's, it just get, it would get weird and awkward. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad they didn't do that. But where they set this episode up, though, going forward is Ahsoka does say you need to take him to Tython, mm-hmm. where he can go to the ancient temple and just have him sit there, and the Force will decide Grogu's fate. It will reach out to another Jedi that will train him. And also, the Mandalorian gets to go with the spear. Yep. So this is where we're left off going forward to Episode 6. So, Pat, in closing of this episode, because like we said, we are going to deep dive into this a little bit more next segment and give you the background of why this characters are so important, getting name-dropped, and what their involvement is with the franchise. Mm -hmm. But let's wrap this uh, review up of the episode five. Great episode. lot to digest and dig into with this one, and quite possibly the biggest episode they've done in the series yet, because the ramifications from this one are going to be felt for a long time. Absolutely. I honestly didn't think they were going to be able to top uh, Bo-Katan right. coming. I thought that it was like, okay, we've hit that. I know Ahsoka was going to get mentioned. Wasn't yeah. sure exactly how this was going to play out, but for what the Mandalorian has done now in five episodes, you brought back Boba Fett, which has ignited the fan base. Hi, uh-huh. right here. You've also introduced Bo Katan and gone in a little bit deeper into the Star Wars missiles with her. Uh-huh. You now have introduced Ahsoka, which is a huge deal yep. in its own right. Yep. And you also name dropped Admiral Thrawn, which is not a throwaway line. No. You have really given some new life to the franchise, which we all know about episodes 7, 8, and 9, and you can have your feelings about them however you want. But for what they're doing in between, this has got the Star Wars community fired up. This has got the regular pop culture Mm -hmm. entranced because they're adding so much that we have seen but yet they were giving a fresh take to it as well. Yeah, and I and I and jumping in real quick, I know some people like myself who've seen Rebels were kind of wondering because given the end of Rebels, where uh, Ahsoka goes off with Sabine to find Admiral Thrawn, uh, people were wondering, all right, where does this story fall in line with that? Uh, full, typical felony fashion, he gave an answer and didn't give an answer. Uh, he did an interview with uh, Vanity Fair and specific, and they brought us specifically the end of the series, Rebel Soups uh, series, and where does this fall in line with it? And if it, this takes place after the series finale of Rebels, he said, quote, that's not necessary, necessarily chronological. I think the thing that people must not most that people will most not understand is they want to go in a linear fashion. But as I learned as a kid, nothing in Star Wars really works in a linear fashion. You do episodes four, five, six, and then one, two, and three. So in the vein of that history, when you look at the epilogue of Rebels, you don't really know how much time has passed. So it's possible that the story I'm telling in The Mandalorian actually takes place prior to that. Possible. I'm saying it's possible. Close quote. So in typical goddamn Filoni fashion... Answers the question, but also doesn't really answer it. Well, I don't think they want to He's give, a master at this. Well, I don't think they want to give anything away because they want to leave the doors open as much as possible. Mm-hmm. That if they come up with a great idea, that they're going to run with it, and they don't want to exactly lock into a timeline where they can't get out of. Yeah. And I get, you know what, I fully understand yeah. that. But for everything they've done with this series, I'm not worried. No. I am like literally do what you want. I'm going to be here. Yeah. Let's go. And, and Filoni is very well versed in answering these kind of questions with that are big and have potential, you know, implications for like the end of a series. He created the character. He helped create or created the character Ahsoka. And then for five years, uh, you know, because six season didn't come until it was like a year or so after and I was on Netflix. But for five years had to deal with getting asked in every interview he did. Does Ahsoka survive? Does Ahsoka survive? Does Ahsoka survive? Because Clone Wars takes place in between episodes two and three. Everyone knows she never shows up in episode three, so everyone kind of just assumes she died. So for five years, he had to answer and dodge questions and get real coy with, you know, does she survive? So he's he's good at answering these. Yeah, he's an absolute master at this. Uh-huh. So 
seeing his handiwork on this episode, those, like I said, might be the best episode they've done thus far. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be very, very hard to top moving forward. Yeah. But hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH. Let's talk Mandalorian. Let us talk Chapter 13, The Jedi. We need to have this discussion, ODPH Society, so let's do it. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I'm Midnight Agent Raw. And I'm Okami. We are the Super Media Bros Podcast. And each week, we give a comedic take on all forms of entertainment, such as movies, music, video games, television, and much more. So put your shades on and listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Shades on. We're all. This is Rich, the host of the Three Fat Nerds podcast and co-host of the Horror Zone 607 podcast. And you are listening to our hashtag 607 podcast brothers, the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. Now kick it back over to Ken Moneybags and the crew. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast. And we are going to be deep diving into the new characters introduced on The Mandalorian. Because mm-hmm. we tried doing it during the recap. I think we've gone on like a super long tangent. And I don't want to lose you on this. Because the two characters introduced are big deals mm-hmm. for various different reasons. But, Pad, why don't you kick us off? Let us go first with Ahsoka Tano. Yeah, so Ahsoka Tano uh, was a character who debuted in the, I believe it was 2008 uh, Star Wars animated film, The Clone Wars. Uh, and she and it was this kind of weird thing where it was like, oh, the Star Wars is coming back to theaters, but it's animated. And it was like, okay. And little did I know it would usher in this mega, you know, animated series that would come to dominate a lot of Star Wars culture over the next you know decade or so. Uh, but the film starts off where it's Anakin and Obi-Wan in the middle of the Clone Wars because the movie and then the series, like I mentioned last segment, take place between episodes two, uh, which is Attack of the Clones, and then episode three, Revenge of the Sith. So right in the heart of the war, right in the, you know, the big part of the war, they're on this planet, you know, they're fighting the separatists and, and they're a big battle and this and that. And they get done, and Obi Wan makes this mention that he has he's requested a new Padawan, and I go, oh shit, you know he's taking on a new Padawan, you know this is this is kind of big, uh, and and this drop ship comes in, and and this little girl steps off the ship, and she goes, oh hi, I'm I'm here, you know for Master Skywalker, and Anakin goes, what? Like no, no, you're supposed to be Obi Wan's Padawan, and she goes, no, Master Yoda specifically told me that uh, you know I was your apprentice. And he goes, I didn't want this. I didn't ask for this. Da-da-da-da-da. So it kind of develops from this, you know, they kind of, and throughout the movie, you see that they, that they hate each other. They don't really get along. He didn't want this. And it goes from this, you know, place of, you know, neither are really sure they want to be there. I think at one point in the film, she actually says she's willing to go back and get reassigned to a different master. But it goes from this, they don't really like each other aspect to they can't, you know, they develop such as de- I don't want to say live without each other because that gets weird because Jedi. Yeah. But, you know, they care about each other, you know, as as brother and sister, and they develop that deep bond to the point where, spoiler, spoiler alert, when Ahsoka leaves the Jedi Order in season five of Clone Wars, he's begging her to not go. That, mm-hmm. like, you, you can just tell he, it's killing him, you know, metaphorically speaking, that, you know, for to see her leave, that he just doesn't want her to leave. Yeah, it's always something that the connection they have is just is so big mm-hmm. is is its own storyline in, in its own right. Yeah, that I know they didn't even really deep dive into that on the Mandalorian. They did kind of like tease a little oh, bit yeah. into, if you really yeah. want to stress it, but they didn't really give you enough that you're like, okay, yeah, this is overshadowing. Yeah, even when she was referring to Yoda on the mm-hmm. show, she said like the first time I've seen, or it's not the first time I've seen a, a creature like this before. This was just kind of a telling point that with Ahsoka, that it was such a big deal that she's Anakin Skywalker's apprentice. Mm-hmm. Which, again, was, you know, in the however many years that Anakin's been in the franchise, it never been mentioned. All the books, all the comics, never been mentioned. And, well, yeah, he's got one. Yeah, he's got one. So this, like we said, huge deal that we as fans were waiting to see. And obviously... Yeah. Doing animated film, it was really kind of like, okay, well, where do we go from here? Because mm-hmm. we don't really have yep. that kind of access. And, yep. and really, like, what else is there to say? I mean, they had uh, the uh, Christopher Lee voice Count Dooku in it, which was cool. And, and uh, 
Samuel L. Jackson reprised his role as Mace Windu for it, which was cool. But then they didn't do it for the series, so eh. No, they definitely did. Corey Burton did a great job as Windu, though. I gotta say that. Right. But as we saw, the character just absolutely won everybody over. Yeah, it, it was one of those things that I very specifically, when the movie was getting ready to come out, uh, I was sitting at work one day and there happened to be a copy of, I think it was like a weekend edition of USA Today sitting there. Mm-hmm. And and because it was Star Wars, uh, I got I turned, I, it was like on the front page of the USA weekend edition or whatever the heck it was. And they were talking about this new character that got introduced for Star Wars and it was Ahsoka. And they and just immediately, like the headline was, was is there a new love triangle in Star Wars? And I'm like, ew, no. Yeah. You know, it went from those, you know, fans were, I don't want to say necessarily like spewing hate and vitriol against it, but they were very like, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm not okay with this to, you know, you go read back to interviews, uh, Ashley Eckstein, who voiced Ahsoka for both uh, Clone Wars and Rebels. Mm -hmm. You know, they went from nobody really cared to, oh my God, she better be okay. I don't want anything to happen to her. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy to see just how she went from not being very well liked to be, at, at the beginning to one of the biggest characters in the franchise. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to stretch from 2008's Clone Wars to now, mm-hmm. and just to see how she absolutely won fans over. Yeah, I mean, it's a true credit to the character, and, obviously- and it, a credit to the writing with Dave Filoni because Dave Filoni was one of the big ones, you know, who who was behind her. Obviously, George George Lucas was a part of it too because uh, George Lucas was involved with the Clone Wars, uh, at least the six seasons of it. I don't know how much input or you know he, development he had with the seventh and final season, but he was very heavily involved with Clone Wars. You know, the, the first five or six seasons, you know, but you, you know he he wanted it. And, and Dave wrote the entire story's character, uh, sto- character's story. You know, it, it's just one of those things that it, it was really cool to see. Yeah, it was absolutely dope to see. So now that we have the Mandalorian introducing mm-hmm. a live action Ahsoka, yeah, is a huge deal and perfect casting too. Like we yeah. can say with Rosario Dawson, who has absolutely embraced the role. In yeah. fact, it was fan casting coming to life. Yeah, folks had been, you know, even before they announced that Ahsoka would be on Mandalorian, you know, and fans will always do this, you know, they, they animated show, they cast somebody as a live action version. And it was funny because I, I was reading an interview that both she and Dave Filoni did with Vanity Fair. There's actually a really deeper connection to it, too. Um, you know, when Rosario Dawson started acting, her grandmother suggested that, listen, if you're going to do this, you need to study it. So mm-hmm. she got sent to an acting school. There was some dude at that acting school named Hayden Christensen. Oh, I might have heard of him. Yeah, you might have heard of him. Might have played as some guy named Anakin Skywalker in uh, Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. Mm-hmm. So it's it's just this weird Kevin Bacon six degrees of separation type of deal where this woman who's been fan casted as this character finally gets the role. But then she also knows and has taken and there's a photo of her with Hayden Christensen online. It's just this weird, like how the universe works out sometimes. It absolutely is. And to see where this character is going to go, because I feel that she will be back. Maybe mm-hmm. not this season mm-hmm. on The Mandalorian, mm-hmm. but I'm not doubting that we won't see a spinoff show. To Could be honest, be. like with the with the fan buzz that came with Ahsoka debuting this week. Uh-huh. Disney does listen to the fans. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure Dave Filoni, now that he finally got to bring one of his uh, prize creations yeah. to the, the small screen slash big screen, if you wanted to find it, yeah. is now saying, okay, well, we've just opened the door. Where else can we go with this character? Right. And it's not just Dave knows how Disney, it's not just Disney that knows how big and how, I don't want precious, I guess you could say, the character is, you know, Lucasfilm and, and Kathleen Kennedy, the president of Lucasfilm, know how much and how big a character Ahsoka is. Yes. You, know, you just look at everything she did and, and what she means to, to girls in the Star Wars fan base that this is one character that I'm confident they're not going to screw up. No, they definitely won't. Like, I would say this is pretty much a lock that we will not see the last of her. And, no. And I'm saying I'm not throwing it that it's out of the realm of thought that we won't see a spinoff show. Could. I think you might see maybe – a live action type rebels maybe there's you, been I, there's been talk of that there's been rumors of that well there's just enough that they're introducing so many new characters mm-hmm. that i i'm looking to see what are they really doing because mm-hmm. this is going to be a long a long play yeah but this season they've introduced so many new characters on the mandalorian mm-hmm. and big ones in the star wars mythos yeah and super popular ones too that you can't just have them show up and yeah. then disappear. Right, and that's one of the things with Rebels where again, I highly recommend you go watch both Clone Wars and Rebels. If you're watching Clone Wars, start with the film, go to the show. 
uh, and then go watch Rebels. Rebels is kind of like an open ending because somebody disappears. I don't want to spoil it. Mm-hmm. Somebody disappears uh, right at the end of the series. And then the, one of the last scenes is Ahsoka meeting up with another character to go find this character. So this character is went missing with another character we're about to discuss. So that's where I kind of think they're leading with this and we might get a tie off to that storyline. But no, like you said, they're definitely introducing enough characters that they could do a spinoff there. I fully think they're going to. And I think that you're going to see an announcement down the road, not, yeah. not right away. Yeah. So I'm not going to say I'm not, I can't really give a timetable. If they do celebration next year, it might be next day. Yeah. Next year. If celebration happens, I fully imagine you're going to hear one to two new shows get announced. Mm hmm bank on it one to two new shows and if ryan johnson is still doing his trilogy you might hear something about that yeah yeah i mean you're gonna hear a lot of updates i think they want to get that live pop from the crowd uh-huh. as they should oh because yeah you, yeah you need to know the temp in the room when you're gonna announce this. yep because everybody knew ahsoka, ahsoka was gonna be the big deal but then they threw another name in the mix holy christ and when this one dropped I think a lot of the fandom went. <gasps> I damn near shit myself. Not gonna lie. I'll admit I marked out. I mm-hmm. was like, mm-hmm. I, I only know so much of this character, but yeah. still, I was like, wait, they're actually going to introduce Grand Admiral Thrawn. Uh huh. Break it down, Pad. So Grand Admiral Thrawn was a character uh, who originally debuted in the old canon expanded universe 1991 novel Star Wars: Heir to the Empire, uh, which was written by the incredible Timothy Zahn. Uh, you know, he was the antagonist in, in, in you know, in, during this time period because the, the book was set not long, if not immediately after uh, Return of the Jedi and the Empire was kind of on the down and outs. They were, you know, I mean, you see a bit of this in Return of the Jedi where, you know, the one super star destroyer goes down and, and things just go fucking haywire for the Empire. They, they can't put two things together, you know, so th- in comes Thrawn, who's this red eyed blue-skinned alien from the unknown regions of, of the universe, because that's the one thing with Star Wars, through old canon and new canon, there's this big old chunk of the universe that just hasn't been explored and ain't nobody dare go near the damn thing for mm-hmm. whatever reason. Uh, he's a part of this race called the Chess, that, like I mentioned, blue-skinned, red-eyed. Uh, you know, they lurk out there. You know, they've uh, his people have formed the Chess Ascendancy, and it's an oligarch. Uh, oligarchy ruled by a handful of families. You know, he was in a low class family, but he kind of builds himself up and he, and he's this master tactician and he eventually makes his way and and joins the empire and becomes, you know, grand admiral and he's this huge thorn in the side of just the good guys in in the new old, new republic uh during the old canon. Yeah, he has definitely been thrown around in in the canon talk of Star Wars fandom that this is a big deal to see him get introduced. So mm-hmm. he is fully here. So all the stories now that are tying him in are going to be brought to the small slash big screen because mm-hmm. I consider Disney Plus is just a spinoff of the big screen. So that's yeah. Oh, yeah. the way I treat yeah. it. So that's why I'm saying yeah. small slash big. And to see Thrawn get introduced and being the new major antagonist is such a monumental deal. Yeah, I mean, because, like I said, if you want to learn more about Thrawn, watch Star Wars Rebels from Season 2, I think it was. No, Season 2 or 3. I forget which one it was he debuted. Uh, Watch from Season 2 or 3 through. You know, they're playing checkers. He's playing, like, nine-dimensional chess. There's one point in the show where the good guys, the main main cast of characters, make it off a planet, and there's an Imperial blockade, and, you know... One of the gunnery officers goes, we, you know, we have a lock on him, sir. And he goes, let him go. And everyone in the in the bridge looks at him and goes, the hell? What? And he goes, no, don't worry. It'll it'll all work itself out later. And they, everyone's just going, uh, we don't really agree with this, but you're you're in charge. So we can't say anything. You know, it's it's just one of those things. He's got this super mind and, and huge brain that, you know, he's he's one of the most gifted military minds that the galaxy has ever seen. And were it not for the fact that he disappeared, rebels might have lost. The the rebels might have lost the, the the war against the empire. Yeah, it's always just interesting to see that he's such a new development because he doesn't have anything to do with the typical force and the dark mm-hmm. side. Yeah, he is just a brilliant yeah. strategist. Yeah, that it's so scary to think that he doesn't have the powers mm-hmm. of Darth Vader. No, he doesn't have. 
Palpatine. So he can't shoot levels. lightning out of his hands. Yeah, he, he doesn't have a lightsaber. He's just a advanced military mind who's got a real eye for art collection. Yeah, it's just there's so many like little uh, Easter eggs they do mm-hmm. with him mm-hmm. that it's just so very cool to see him get brought in. So now that we're seeing this version getting brought to, we're assuming the Mandalorian. Yep. I would say whatever spinoff show they're going to do, because we have already touched upon this. Yeah. They've introduced too many characters just to say, all right, one and done. Yeah. Then, like I said, they're not name dropping Thrawn just to do it. It's it's like it's like if, if you look back at the Avengers one uh, post credit scene mm-hmm. and, and you see Thanos, they didn't just drop Thanos in there for the oh shit moment. Like that was a larger planet play. Same thing with this. You're not just name dropping Thrawn to just go, yeah, that we're just dropping a name and drop a name. They have larger plans. Yeah, they have so much bigger plans for him that when they finally decide to unveil what they're going to do, mm-hmm. it's gonna be huge. Yeah. And I have no idea about fan casting. So Pad, let me throw it to you. Mm-hmm. If you could cast Thrawn right now, yeah. Who's playing him? Well, I know he's voiced by Lars uh, Mickelson. Uh, no idea if it's any relation to Madden. Uh, you know, he voices uh, Thrawn in the latter two seasons of Rebels. So my my gut instinct is to go that route, mm-hmm. you know, just because he knows the character, he's voiced the character. The only thing I think might be a hinge is, is if he's not a fan of having to wear blue paint on his skin for multiple hours a day. So that would be kind of my first guess. Um, If you can't go that route, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch would be good. I was thinking him too. I British act because that's the thing is British actor all, all British people are evil in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> Sorry, but it's a fact. It is fact. It's a weird trait that happens yeah. there. No, I think that Cumberbatch would be amazing in it. Cumberbatch would be good. Yeah, I I could fully see him doing that because you need somebody that's you know almost like robotic about it. And it, and to me, I think he I think Cumberbatch would be down to do it. Just because to me it seemed, you know, obviously he played uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes in the BBC series. Mm. It's almost like an evil take on Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. uh, In a sense where super big mind, eight steps ahead of your opponents, but like not exactly in it for the good reasons. Right. I could also see Michael Fassbender. Oh, yeah. Fassbender. Fassbender would be good. Fassbender would be good too. Fassbender would be good. I know I saw Cody Rhodes throw his name in in the... Discussion, well, he's but, a Star Wars mega fan, so that doesn't surprise. Yeah, me. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me either. No. But I, I can't see him. No, doing that. no. The, the pyro alone would be causing too much. <laughs> yeah. But to see that we're gonna have Thrawn now in the in the mix. Yeah. And there's so many stories you can tell with him. Yeah. And obviously, seeing how they're listening, the Star Wars brass is listening to the fans, mm-hmm. and now bringing the canon that was you know on the fence considered. Okay, is this yeah. part of the universe? Yeah. Or not. Yeah. Now they're introducing those elements and now making them part of the, the saga. Yeah. It's amazing to see that the stories that people were, like, considering throwaways. I mean, I, I wouldn't mm-hmm. say throwaways because if yeah. you're fans of them, they do mean something. Oh, yeah, yeah. But to see that the ones that have been ignored for so long are now finally getting some shine, mm-hmm. it's a truly telling thing to see. And I think it just further goes to show that it, for as little you hear from Lucasfilm, because let's face it, they're, them and Marvel are about the two most tight-lipped organizations in the industry. Uh, for as little as you hear from them, they're always working on stuff, and there's always stuff in the plans. Yes, yeah, so we're definitely going to have to sit back and wait and see what is going to go on. But two major characters were introduced on The Mandalorian this week. Mm-hmm. They are not going to be one and done. So I guarantee no, you that. No, no, no. But what's the next direction going to be? Is it going to be a New Republic show? Is it going to be Rebels? Killing Boba Fett again. Bite your tongue. <laughs> well, now hear this blasphemy on my ear. Bringing back Jar Jar. Yeah, if he can get killed off by Boba, I will mark out. I will. You you want to rant? Get get the Twitch ready. I'll even make a TikTok for it. If, if Jar Jar gets killed off by Boba Fett, I will TikTok the living hell out of that thing. Mark the tape now. But definitely let us have this discussion online on our social media accounts. You can find all that and so much more at OchoDuroParleyHour.com. What is your thoughts about Ahsoka and Thrawn getting introduced to the mass Star Wars universe? Let's have that discussion, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Are you tired of watching the same old awesome movies? Are B-movies more your style? Then the folks over at They Call This A Movie have you covered. Join us every Thursday as we review the worst of the worst in sci-fi, action, comedy, and more. We are available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Podbean at theycallthisamovie.podbean.com. They Call This A Movie, testing the strength of friendships one terrible movie at a time. Hi, 
Hi, this is Tyler from Second Suitor, and you're listening to the ODPH Podcast. I want you to get it. I want you to understand. I'm doing the best I can, but not as good as I want to be. I just want to get it. I just want to comprehend that I have to make amends with the monster. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, and we're talking about canon, mm-hmm. getting introduced to the mainstream storylines with The Mandalorian, but that was not the only one that has, I guess, been referenced this week about canon joining a storyline. Okay. Now, this past week, Daredevil is now officially back to Marvel mm-hmm. from Netflix. They got the rights. The, the rights are back. They, so, can, they can write about them. They can put them in scripts. They can film them if they wanted to and knock at their pantsuit off. Exactly. So the first of the Defenders family is now back in mm-hmm. the House of the Mouse. Mm-hmm. And this has now reignited the hashtag Save Daredevil campaign. Now, if you're not familiar with it, once uh, Netflix had canceled Daredevil, Mm -hmm. there is a very vocal fan group that has immediately jumped on with the hashtag Save Daredevil. And what they were pushing is for Marvel, once they got the rights, to bring back everybody that was involved in the first uh, series. Mm -hmm. So Charlie Cox coming back is Matt Murdock. Vincent D'Onofrio coming back is Kingpin. Uh, if Vincent D'Onofrio doesn't reprise his role as Kingpin, there might be actual riots. Oh, I fully believe it. And he's been very vocal. He wants to come back. Uh, Charlie Cox has definitely expressed he would love to come back. Um, mm-hmm. And the fan base has now been becoming very vocal. Yeah. And this is one thing I love seeing about fans when they're not being toxic, but they're just saying, we want our, our show back. Yeah. Because Daredevil, for what it was on Netflix, was the best Marvel show they've done. Yeah. It was edgy. It was gritty. It is everything that you want to see from a Daredevil comic because Daredevil is the equivalent, I would say, mo- more so than Moon Knight the, to Batman. Yeah, I would say he's not exactly a Boy Scout, so it ain't exactly all sunshine and roses. No, very complex character. When he's written well, he's written phenomenally. When he's not, eh, I'll just save that for another podcast. But for what this show did is it really captured a lot of mainstream fans that were not necessarily into the MCU. Yeah. Which I know is a little wild to think because obviously with the popularity of the Avengers franchise, yeah. Yeah. it's hard to say that fans were not exactly into the Avengers and what the MCU was doing. Daredevil is a more grounded hero. Yeah. Always has been. Yep. Uh, getting his powers from a uh, radioactive spill mm-hmm. uh, and losing his sight, but enhancing his other senses. And then battling his complexity of moral right versus wrong. And seeing where this character has gone throughout the years, I mean, has just truly been a journey. Charlie Cox brought it to screen perfectly. Mm-hmm. Vincent D'Onofrio as his foil as the kingpin, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. You can't take anything away from that. Season two, you can say, might have been a minor misstep. Sure. But it is what it is. It was but, a step laterally instead of forward. Right. I mean, it's still good, but not exactly the home run that I think a lot of people were expecting. Mm-hmm. However, season three of Daredevil was Whew. brilliant. Absolutely and utterly uh-huh. brilliant. You cannot top the bullseye born again storyline. True. One of the classic stories of all of comics, let alone probably Daredevil's greatest story. Mm-hmm. Frank Miller put together a masterpiece. And this was delivering on all and every front. So where this has been leading is the hype has just overridden itself. And now that the rights are officially back to Marvel, you're now seeing a very vocal fan base come out along with other actors that have been involved in the MCU. Clark Reg has tweeted out, say with me people, hashtag save Daredevil. Vincent D'Onofrio has been posting a lot on Twitter saying about how we need to say save Daredevil and put it out loud and make sure it happens. And obviously everybody involved with the show has definitely been doing it. Mm -hmm. And this is something that, Pat, let me throw this at you. Mm -hmm. If you are Marvel, do you bring them back? I bring the characters back. There's no way on God's green earth they're going to continue the series from what it was. Uh, Don't get me wrong. I love the series. I thought it was great. The actors and actresses were great. But there's no way that... Kevin Feige will continue that show. And and I'll let me before people start screaming at me, let me explain. Charlie Cox, great performance, like you said. Vincent D'Onofrio, great performance, like you said. But you dial back or re- rewind the clock on a pr- earlier previous episode where we talked about how much the old Marvel television division and the old Marvel film division didn't like each other. That if you lock them in a room together, you're not sure who's going to come out alive. Yeah. 
and it's very well known and very well publicized that Kevin Feige was not a fan of Jeff Loeb or some of the stuff he did. So why would he bring back the show that Jeff Loeb was the producer of and in charge of, you know, if he didn't, if, if, because let's face it, we know how much Kevin Feige didn't like Jeff Loeb's stuff. Mm. There was supposed to be that whole, uh, what was it? The, the Hellstrom series was supposed to spin yep. off into something further. The Midnight Suns universe. Min, uh, Midnight Suns universe. But as soon as, you know, the Marvel film division absorbed the Marvel television division, and Feige took it over and kicked Jeff Loeb to the curb. They axed the rest of that and made the Hellstrom series a one and done. You know, the, it's very well documented. So I, I don't rule out them bringing back Charlie Cox and, and Vincent D'Onofrio and some of the other folks involved with not just that series, but Luke Cage and Jessica Jones and Iron Fist. The, you know, some of the, the characters involved with that. Christ, I'd love to see David Tennant on screen as, as uh, Purple Man again. Mm. You know. I don't doubt that, but I don't think there's any way they'll reference or bring up what's already happened. That they'll just kind of treat it as a soft reboot and they'll, you know, do it kind of like Spider Man already been in the universe, kind of palling around, just haven't made it to necessarily the big time yet. I fully think they're going to do a show. Oh, yeah, I do too. I just don't think it'll be season four of Daredevil. Well, it won't get acknowledged. Yeah, I, I fully agree with what you're saying because I think that those characters are too connected. Uh huh. And the fans, I, I don't think out of all the Netflix shows, fans would accept anybody else recasted no. as them. Charlie Cox is Daredevil. Done. Vincent D'Onofrio is the kingpin. Yeah. Anybody else playing those roles, it just would not mesh. No. You you can't. It, it, it's hard because it's not like in the position they were with Spider-Man where Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2 kind of left a sour taste in people's mouth. Fantastic Four, the 2015 version. I don't even have to say anything. But exactly. What, you know, you know, X Men mixed taste. You know, some good, some bad. But that's relatively easy to do. Obviously, exceptions being Professor Xavier and Wolverine. But you know, the rest of them, it's it's very easy to die to recast. You know, it's very easy to recast Mister Fantastic, Johnny Storm. You know, uh, Sue Storm. You know, and then uh, Ben Grimm. Because let's face it, the 2015 version was a hot pile of garbage. Yeah. You know, everyone wants to get the taste out of their mouth of that movie ASAP. It's not as easy as with Punisher, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and Daredevil because those those series were very much liked. Obviously, some of them you know had had their criticisms, and, and fans weren't as you know big on them as other ones. But still, people liked the performances. So I I think they have to bring them back. I think they absolutely have to, and I think for Daredevil, I would not doubt that they get their show in oh, at yeah. some point. Yeah. I think that if any- it's, just, it's just they won't, it'll be a soft reboot. It won't reference anything that's already happened. Oh yeah, no, they're not going to touch upon it. They're just going to go on like businesses just happened. Mm-hmm. That I think mm-hmm. is a smart move because the one thing about Daredevil is. Even after Born Again, yeah, there has still been some great runs with that character. And and just thinking off the top of my head, I mean, you can even write this in that Daredevil rose and and out of I don't want to say the ashes, but he rose. Be- oh, you did. I mean, you could say it. Well, he rose. From out, Born Again. He he wrote. Well, yeah, no, but he rose out of out of a need for heroes after the events of Infinity War, where you think there's that five year gap where we saw how New York looked in Endgame. Where you got to imagine things were real bad and real down and out, looting stuff and going nuts and, and just, you know, a general sense of chaos and, and craziness that, and, and, you know, you also remember the poster in Endgame where it's, where are they? And it yeah. was the, and it was the shadowed silhouettes of the Avengers. So you've got the main heroes that everyone knows ain't stepping up. So you've got folks like a Luke Cage, like a, a Danny Rand, like a Jessica Jones, like a Matt Murdock who go, you know what? They're not going to do it. I'm going to do it. Yeah, I think that that's a smart move to do. And obviously the uh, incident, Mm -hmm. uh, you're allowed a little gray area of what you want to play around with. too. So it's a quick fix that they say, well, this is how everybody came over and we just don't even address the Netflix first, which is smart to do. The only other issue they're going to have Mm -hmm. is all of these shows Mm -hmm. are not Disney Plus friendly. No. As good as that hallway scene is in season one of Daredevil, there no way in hell that's Disney friendly. Yeah, so Yo. the struggle becomes where do you go with them? Now, the easy move would be just put them on Hulu. Right. That's the easiest yeah. thing they could do. Yeah, that, that might be the easiest form to do. I mean, plus the other thing about it too is, is if, you know, hypothetical, they go to decide to continue all, each of these series from what they were you're really going to tell people to go watch the previous seasons and catch up on this show, go to our competitor. 
Well, the shows are going to be off Netflix. No, Netflix is going to keep those. Oh, they're keeping them. Yeah, no, you go to Netflix these days, they're still there. Even even with the rights reverted back from that, they're still there. See, I wasn't sure about that. I think that they come back when each character is released. So, no. so we'll, have to, we'll have to follow up about that because I, I, I'm not a thousand percent sure about that. I'm pulling it up now. Okay. But either way, though, you're going to have to find a way to bring these characters back that makes sense. For Daredevil, that's an easy fix. For Punisher, I'm showing I'm showing kind of my phone now with Mar- right. with Netflix. No, yeah, Fair. Daredevil's still there. Fair enough. I honestly thought that when the rights were reversed, they they got them back. No, right? that no, that was one of the things that I remember when they canceled the show and Disney Plus was coming. That like it wasn't publicly said, but like insiders were saying that even after the show was like the show was over and, and Disney Plus started, they were still going to keep the shows there well, because I mean, that, it's their own content. Yeah. I mean, I was going to, I was just going to say, all right, that makes sense because yeah. it's their own content. I just figured that they were just going to get them like everything. Comes no, back. no, they get, they just get the rights. So if, like I said, hypothetical, they go to do season four of daredevil. You, you as Disney are really going to say, Hey, we know this is a really big show. And some of you might not have seen it, but go watch the first three seasons on our competitors platform. Well, they're never going to do that. Cause obviously how messy that divorce was. Yep. Forget about it. Yep. Like that's yep. that's not happening. No way, no shape, no form. Mm-hmm. So that's why I thought the only way they could do it is they were bringing the shows over. But no. like I said, I don't. I haven't really followed that much of the deal. No. The only thing I know is the rights are now back. Yeah, their rights are back. So now it's just where do we go from here? And for Daredevil, like I said, the easy money is go to Hulu. Mm-hmm. That would be the easiest. That's, thing pr- that's probably the safest bet. But I think what they we might see is how does Moon Knight translate on Disney Plus? Yeah. Because Moon Knight, let's face it is a very edgy character Mm -hmm. and is not exactly Disney friendly. No, I mean, but they run PG-13 stuff on there. Oh, yeah, you know, absolutely. But it's just how much are you going to push that envelope? And then with Daredevil, how far do you push that? Like with Punisher. There ain't no way Punisher's going Disney+. Plus. Yeah, Punisher's not going Disney+. Christ. They they can't. No. No. There's no way that could make any sense. So Punisher would be the only one in flux, even though uh, John Bernthal has, has been extremely vocal. Mm-hmm. The minute those rights are back, he wants in, and he. Will, yeah. I, I fully believe that he, if it came down to fighting somebody for it, he would actually fight them. For money's, the I'll say, money's on Bernthal. Yeah, I would not. I would not take the role away from him. No. Nor, nor should you. Uh, the only ones that I think would be in, in a little bit of kind of flux of what they want to do would be uh, Power Man, Iron Fist, and Jessica Jones. Yeah. Because obviously, and I, I did say Power Man, because I think that you're going to see a Heroes for Hire show. Probably. I don't think that you see anything else otherwise. You're not going to see them in their own shows. No. Not saying the characters couldn't carry it, but I think that Marvel is going to say, you know what, we can definitely run this as a private eye investigation, Heroes for Hire, and mm-hmm. it would make sense. Yeah. With Jessica Jones, obviously the connection with Luke Cage in the MCU. Mm-hmm. Where would she go from here? Because she doesn't exactly have a long history of comics. No. So you can and, make her a recurring character with the Heroes for Hire show. Yeah, and I think that would make sense to do as well. It'd or, be or somebody have, that like they they regularly consult with. Yeah, or she is just a, a part of the team. You yeah. make a trio yeah. instead of a, a pair. So yeah. there is a lot of room they can work with there if they want to. Uh, last I knew, I thought Kristen Ritter did not want to return as as Jessica Jones. Okay. So, but that could have changed. That's fine. That could have changed last I heard because, like I say, I have not been following up on the Netflix shows. Yeah. And, because. Let's face it. Until they got the role, the rights r- r- given back to Marvel, yeah. what's there to talk about? You can just speculate so much. Yeah. But now, since Daredevil has kicked in that door, where Marvel goes from here, very interesting. It's going to be a lot of interesting moves that they can do because for Marvel, ticking off that fan base, which let's face it, it's been two years and they have been rabid mm-hmm. about getting these characters back and these actors back. Yeah. So you can't just sit on your hands and, and say, well, maybe nothing will happen. Everything will be fine. Right. No, you're going to need to produce something. Now, where are you going to hear it first? I would say if they're going to do San Diego next year, mm-hmm. that would be a spot. And it just obviously depends on everything going on in the world. So I don't want to even speculate that we'll definitely see something there. Right. But I would imagine that they want to have a DC fandom like event. Yeah. San Diego Comic Con would be perfect if that is going to be the case. Yeah, but then again, we have to see where we are in the world. Yeah, and it, and it's going to be a while before we see anything. I mean, obviously, we know Phase Four is in ink. We yeah. know it's coming for Phase Four. I would imagine that Phase Five is probably half to three quarters in ink. The remaining half or quarter of it is in pencil. Mm-hmm. You know that they got that figured out pretty much well so we may not see anything with this universe and that may be by design because i imagine that whatever feige has planned 
that he wants, you know, he wants to have all the pieces back before he starts going. You know, it doesn't make sense to drive a car if you only got, you know, one wheel. You know, that may be by design so that it may not be until maybe phase six before we see anything. Yeah, I mean, there's – and it's not to say that it's all the realm of thought. They, right. they wouldn't jump something. Right. Because they have done that in the past. And obviously with the schedule they have coming out for 2021, in theory, if everything is still coming out – right. I mean, they're going to have such a stacked year that it's not to say it's completely out of the realm of thought to do this. Right. But until then, Disney is going to have a lot on their hands to do. Mm-hmm. I know that there is an online petition that Vincent D'Onofrio has been asking fans to sign for this. Sure. And according to comicbook.com, as I'm reading right now, three um, 370,000 signatures Ooh, and counting. That's a lot. So we have to, have to wait and see. But if the fans are being this vocal about it, this is where they need to do. So it's anybody's guess to do. I know Vincent D'Onofrio tweeted this out, so I'm going to see if I can find the tweet in between segments, and I will post it on our uh, Twitter account as well, at OD Parlay Hour. But a lot to digest if this is going down, but since the Netflix Defenders universe might be coming home, what's the next phase for them? Hit us up on the hashtag, hashtag ODPH, and let us know what you think. Are you excited to see Daredevil and company come back to the MCU, and what do you think is the fate of their show moving forward? Let's have that discussion. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Brian Wolf from Fair City Fire. You are listening to ODPH, the greatest podcast in Binghamton. Woo! Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, and let's go home with those one-shots, Pad. Got to talk about a few things, first of which is uh, some sad news, of course. Over the weekend, it was announced that Dave Prouse, uh, the original Darth Vader actor, passed away at the age of 85. Uh, Prouse's agent, Thomas Boeington, uh, confirmed to the Hollywood, Re- Hollywood Reporter that he died early morning in the early morning on Saturday, November 28th, following a short illness. Uh, Boeington management also shared the news on Twitter, saying, quote, It's with great regret and heart-wrenching sadness for us and millions of fans around the world to announce that our client, Dave Prouse, has passed away at the age of 85. Uh, Prouse, of course, was born on July 1st, 1935 in Bristol, England, uh, and, you know, went on early on in his life, or I guess his adult life, was a bodybuilder and a a professional weightlifter, even going so far as to tour with some dude named Arnold Mm -hmm. when he went on his tours over in Europe. Uh, Eventually, you know, he went and competed in the Mr. Universe bodybuilding competition uh, winning it in 1960 and then won the British weightlifting championship from 1962 to 1964. So, of course, with his frame at seven or six foot seven inches tall, uh, he became uh, began acting. Uh, he made appearances in the Beverly Hillbillies, The Saint and even Doctor Who. Uh, okay. He even starred as the Mighty Tonka in a toy co- commercial directed by Ridley Scott, of all people. Uh, I know he helped uh, Christopher Reeve train and get some bodybuilding done for his role as Superman in the uh, Superman films. Mm-hmm. He portrayed Frankenstein's monster in 1967's Casino Royale, uh, 1970's The Horror of Frankenstein, and 1974's Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. You know, uh, and then, of course, he obviously, as most people know, was the man behind the suit. He was Darth Vader uh, for episodes one, two, and three, although not for much of three. Uh, I know he did an interview where, for one reason or another, he was not used for most of the filming of Return of the Jedi. But when it came time for the Vader to throw Emperor Palpatine down the, the chasm, uh, the gentleman they had in the acting suit just couldn't do it. Hmm. He's sitting there, he's sitting there, and, they, and they, I, I remember him doing an interview with an, a podcast where he was saying that they tried for like two, three days and just couldn't do it, couldn't do it, couldn't do wow. it. Wow. And so he's like, and the, so he's just sitting there, and he's like, I'm not going to do it. So they're like, oh, okay. So he puts the suit on, he gets up there, action, one take. He just picks him up. And drops him, huh. you know. So, a huge loss for the Star Wars community. For for as much as James Earl Jones is Darth Vader, because you think of Darth Vader, you hear the voice, you right. think, you think of the breathing. Dave Prowse is equally a part of that history and that legacy because without him and his size and just the the acting job he did in those movies, because he made that figure very menacing and imposing, and you know he entered on screen, you kind of sat back in your chair and went, "Oh shit, Vader's here." 
So a huge loss for not just the Star Wars community, but just the world in general. Yeah, absolutely. Condolences to his family, friends, and fans all over the world. It's a huge loss. So yeah. obviously rest in peace. Yep. Yeah, absolutely rest in peace. Switching over to some Pokemon news because this one caught my eye and I, holy shit, didn't realize this. Uh, after 20 years, uh, uh, one of the original generation Pokemon is finally going to be able to be printed on cards again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for those of you who might remember Pokemon, uh, the Pokemon Kadabra, uh, I didn't realize this. It has been nearly 20 years since uh, Kadabra last appeared on a Pokemon card. Okay. So, so apparently back in 2000, uh, an illusionist and magician by the name of Uri Geller uh, decided to sue Nintendo. Uh, because the name when Kadabra, when printed in Japanese, sounds like his name, uh, Uri Geller. You know, even even when I'm looking at the article on IGN, is spelled. Then this is the This is how Kadabra is written in Japanese. One variation is Y U N G E L L E R, Young Geller. So you, I can see the difference of the kind of similarities there. But also one of uh, Uri Geller's. Uh, things he's known for is being able to bend spoons with his mind and if anyone is familiar with the pokemon Kadabra, he's holding spoons and he's bending them so 20 years ago he decided to sue nintendo and ask that they that the Kadabra no longer be allowed to put up on pokemon cards however over the weekend it, he decided to tweet out quote i am truly sorry for what i did 20 years ago kids and grown-ups i am releasing the ban it's now all up to nintendo to bring my Kadabra pokemon card back it will probably be probably be one of the rarest cards now. Much love and energy to all. Yeah, this is definitely some interesting stuff. Yeah, it's it huge. Uh, he even went on to do, uh, Uri Geller went on to do an interview with uh, The Gamer uh, where he expanded on his decision a little bit, and he said that, quote, due to the tremendous volume of emails I am still getting begging me to allow Nintendo to bring back Kadabra slash Young Geller, I sent a letter to the chairman of Nintendo giving them permission to relaunch the Uri Geller Kadabra Young Geller worldwide. So, you know, uh, he also said in, that in his letter was his letter was was received by two Nintendo representatives. So now it appears that, you know, Nintendo's got it, got the rights or at least the permission to back to bringing the card back to uh, printing. How are you feeling about that? That's just wild because I, I admittedly haven't collected Pokemon cards in quite a while. But I do remember having a Kadabra card and I just never realized that. This is one of those weird things that, like, somehow, because in, in the day and age, like, the internet wasn't what it was, mm-hmm. but somehow it slipped through, and I had no idea that this was going on. And, and, and I'll admit, when I go down the rabbit hole of Facebook videos every now and again, I'll get, like, a somebody unboxing a rare Pokemon card or something. But it's just never come up that I figured in, in the day and age of the internet that it is, especially with places like movie details on Reddit and, and just every hashtag you can think of where it's like, today I learned... I would have figured that at some point along the line with as big as Pokemon's get it is and as long as it's been going that something like that would have been like hey did you know cuz today I learned that you know Nintendo hasn't been able to print Kadabra on a Pokemon card for 20 years because of a lawsuit. It's it's just one of those mind-blowing things that I just had no idea. I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." Yeah, no, it sounds absolutely crazy. I mean, you're the more Pokemon expert than I am. Yeah. But just hearing about this is like, "Whoa." Yeah. This is Wow. Yeah, and speaking of Pokemon, and I mentioned how long it's been going. It was teased uh, this past week at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Uh, the The Pokemon 25th anniversary is coming very soon. Uh, Pokemon Red and Green, of course, the original two games that launched in Japan, launched on February 27th, 1996. So we're just a couple of months away from the 25th anniversary. And Lord knows when it's an anniversary for Pokemon, they never half-ass it. They go all out. I don't know what they got planned, but they did put out a new logo uh, during the 25th, uh, or excuse me, during the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, where there was like an army of Pikachus, and I was kind of wanting, I I dropped the ball, I wasn't playing the Imperial March when they were walking on screen, Mm because if you haven't seen that video, it's funny. Uh, but they did have a bunch of Pikachu costumes there dancing and they did unveil a new logo, which I'm showing Ken here. It, it, of course, Pikachu's silhouetted face, but instead of having the uh, trademark red circles on his cheeks, it is a two on one side and a five on the other side. So they, the Pokemon Twitter account did say our 20 Pokemon 25th anniversary celebration kicks off in 2021. Stay tuned for more details. Close quote. So if you're a big Pokemon fan, uh, rip your wallets. Yeah. Not like tear them in half, but like RIP your wallets. Yeah. They, they're oof, gone. They're going to be, they're going to go big. Yeah. This is, it's so wild to see. Like, uh-huh. I, like I'm sorry. Like I'm, I'm watching the video pad is showing me here and I'm like, has it been that long? Yeah. I hard to believe that what started out as this simple card game and video game and even an anime is still going 25 years later. I will admit, I didn't think it'd be going this long. Yeah. No, Neither I, did my parents. I never thought it would go this far. No, I really just didn't. Wild. But, but seeing it happen live, it's like, yeah, 
Yep. Switching over to some movie news. Uh, it's being rumored that Godzilla vs. King Kong may go to HBO Max after Netflix has failed a $200 million offer. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sorry. Just wrapping my head around the money getting thrown around for this and, yeah. and it, seeing it get denied. I'm, all right, take it away. I'm sorry. I mean, Joe. Yeah. So this is according to uh, the Hollywood Reporter. The negotiation, quote, negotiations are reportedly underway to shift the franchise movie to streaming. Uh, the outlet has heard from various sources that Netflix made an offer of more than $200 million to bring Godzilla vs. King Kong to its streaming service, but Warner Media blocked the deal while preparing an offer of its own uh, for its streamer HBO Max. Close quote. Legendary declined to comment on the story while a Warner Brothers spokesperson stated that the movie would be sticking to its uh, release plans after the studio previously postponed the monster mash tentpole from november 20th 2020 to may 21st 2021 saying quote we plan to release godzilla vs king kong theatrically next year as scheduled the spokesperson insisted however the outlet noted that warner media ceo jason Kalar and warner brothers chairman ann sarnoff are reviewing the options and trying to figure out an offer uh, for a streaming release on HBO Max that, in theory, also includes a theatrical component, similar to its the revised release plans for Wonder Woman 1984, which, as we know, will uh, be in theaters and HBO Max uh, on December 25th. So, very interesting news. I know this is one that they want to get out. This is a big movie for them. And with the reports and kind of rumors that, you know, uh, Wonder Woman 1984, once it's on HBO Max, it's not going to be permanently there. They've, not even with, like, the kind of... Uh, door the swinging uh circle doorway format hbo max has that it's just going to be on there for a limited time so if you're looking for a way to keep subscribers there putting a movie like uh godzilla versus king kong not long after is a smart move it's a smart move with everything going on in the world right now and the one thing i keep stressing when i'm talking to everybody on social media yeah Look, it's going to debut on HBO Max, but there's no way this is not going for a big theatrical release when everything is in a good place. Uh Same thing with Wonder Woman 84. Like, look, this is the state of the world we're in right now. Yeah. If Warner's really wants to push HBO Max, and we have been very critical of them doing such because their subscriptions have not exactly been lighting the world on fire. Nope. If they want to do this to entice people to check out their sh- streaming service, more power to them. Yeah. I have no issue with this. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not complaining about it. Yeah. Does it suck? Yeah, it does. But you know what also sucks? I haven't been able to go to a movie theater since March. Mm-hmm. But I deal with it. So the last movie I saw in theaters was uh, Birds of Prey. Yeah. And that was February. Yeah. For me, it was Bloodshot. So that being said, the fact that we have to wait a little longer, we're still going to get new content, which is great. Mm-hmm. I'm all here for it. Yeah. Is not a bad thing, but for everybody is like, well, you know, it's not going to come out in theaters. Look, it's going to come out at some point. Mm-hmm. There's no way you do a big monster movie like Godzilla versus King Kong, yeah, and you don't have it on the big screen. Mm-hmm. There's no way, even if it's a limited release in the theaters, yeah. If you're really that big diehard Godzilla fan or King Kong fan, mm-hmm. you're going to go to a theater, yeah. End this story. Same thing with Wonder Woman. That if yeah. you are that big of a fan and you claim that you rep DCEU all day, every day, you're going to the theaters. Mm-hmm. So everybody just has to wait a little bit longer to do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and like we said, they want to put more eyes on HBO Max because, like they said, the subscribers haven't been exactly what they want. But like I said uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, there's a lot of great stuff on uh, HBO Max. Like just added uh, this week for because it's the first of the month, uh, they added Gladiator. And this is to HBO Max. Gladiator, Shawshank Redemption, Hot Fuzz. Uh, looking through the list, uh, Wrath of the Titans. Uh, let's see what else did they add. I saw Final Destination One, Final Destination Two. Uh, the Blind Side just got added to that. Project X just got added. Uh, you know, so that's just a few of the things they've added and on top of what's already there. So it, it's a great catalog, but just, you know, the numbers and, and the eyes aren't there like they would like. Right. But give it time because they yeah. need, they needed an original program to really entice yeah. somebody. Yeah. The flight attendant just came out. I've heard very good things about it okay. from people. So I need to go watch it. So I just have not had time to. I still got to see the final episode of The Undoing because holy shit, that's sh- that it's a mini series. If you haven't seen it on HBO Max uh, because it's on, on HBO. Six episodes, uh, Hugh Grant and then Nicole Kidman are the two main folks in that show. Uh, also, Donald Sutherland is in it. Oh, sign me up. Holy shit, it's good. Like, even Travis Scott, the rapper, has watched it, and, like, it is real damn good. 
Yeah, I've seen him talk about it a little bit too. It's just there's so much coming on right now that I just have to catch up on. But for HBO Max, it's a win-win. Mm-hmm. And especially you have that vault that you need to start building new content. Yeah, yeah. Because let's face it, Disney's beating everybody right now. Netflix is still in the conversation. Mm-hmm. Apple TV is hanging in there. Yeah. Hulu is definitely there, but let's face it, it's 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 the other side of the coin to Disney Plus at this stage. Pretty much. So for HBO Max, you need to have something that really entices people. Once your original program starts coming, that's what's going to really hook people. And like I said, so far the I've heard nothing but positive reviews of the flight attendant. Okay. So definitely want to check that out when I get some time. But right now, I am actually hooked on uh, Marvel Six One Six. Okay. I have to watch that. I'm I'm hoping to review that for next week's episode. Okay. So definitely stay tuned for that. Yeah. But for Godzilla. Hey, we just have to wait a little bit longer for him to see him and King Kong tear it up on the big screen. Uh huh. And then, lastly, a little quick update to a story we talked about a couple of times. Warner Brothers officially announced uh, last week that Mads Mikkelsen has been cast as Gellert Grindelwald in Fantastic Beasts Three. Uh, he is replacing Johnny Depp, who resigned from the role earlier this month. Uh, Mikkelsen, who of course was in Rogue One, Hannibal, and Doctor Strange, just to name a few. James Bond as well. Christ, I'd be here all day if I tried to list every major movie he's been in. Yeah. Uh, he does join a cast that includes Eddie Redmayne, Catherine Waterson, Dan Fogler. Allison Sudal, Ezra Miller, uh, Caleb Turner, William Nadlam, Poppy Co- Cor- Corby uh, Tooch, Jessica Williams, Victoria Yeats, and Jude Law. Uh, and we should note there are Fantastic Beasts 3 currently scheduled to open July 15th, 2022. Very, very interesting. Uh-huh. I think he can pull it off. Obviously, it's you know not the same actor, but uh, Mads does have a little experience playing villains uh, obviously playing the role of Hannibal Lecter in the prequel Hannibal yeah you know great you know obviously being the villain in uh, uh what is it Casino Royale he's got the chops to play a villain actor and I think if there's anybody who can get as close to what Johnny Depp was bringing on the screen in the last one I think Mads can do it yeah he's fantastic yeah. so I have no doubt in what he's yeah. gonna bring to the franchise so for my one shots uh in news I did not expect to ever hear okay Peter Dinklage we all know him, Tyron Lannister. He drinks and he knows things. Yes. Uh, he's going to know about trauma films, apparently, because Uh-oh. it has been announced that he is connected to the reboot of the Toxic Avenger film. So Good Lord, really? Deadline's reporting this. Uh, so File things I didn't expect to read uh, for a 1,000. Yeah, so Dinklage is set to uh, be the star. Now, it, now, it's not clear that he's going to play the Toxic Avenger. Sure, he just he's in the movie. But, yeah, but he's going to be the star of the film, and it's obviously details are sketchy right now of what's connected. But if you've never seen the Toxic Avenger, wow. Uh, it's B-list as B-list can get. Uh, if you know trauma films, they are who they are. Uh, I'm not hating on them. It's just it's an experience to be involved. But this is a remake of the 1984 film of a janitor who is involved in a toxic waste accident and comes out looking like the Hulk but very disfigured. Uh, Enough said there. Just bad. It it is what it is. Uh, That's the easiest way to describe it. It has an extreme cult following. Yeah. Extreme. This is true. Like, there are people that are very, very enthralled with this franchise. I'm not hating on it, like I, I want to stress, because, like, for me, it doesn't move the needle, but I get the people that right. love it, right. so I'm not mad about it. Um, I just was like, when I heard that Peter Dinklage was casted, I was like, wait, they're doing a remake. Like, that is my mm. initial, like, wait, what? But it is what it is. Um, I'm interested to see it um, when it comes out. Yeah. Because, like I said, uh, things I was not expecting to hear was just a Toxic Avenger remake. So let alone Peter Dinklage is involved, and I'm a huge fan of him, so I cannot wait to check this out when it when I see a trailer come out. Yeah. So I'll be definitely excited for that. And then for uh, my other one-shots, uh, it's a big comic week. Okay. So I want to stress Marvel is coming out with a lot of uh, probably their biggest uh, crossover to date King and Black, number one. So this is the big Venom crossover. Donny Cates' farewell to the character. Uh, it looks fantastic. I have, I've I've heard a couple spoilers, which I'm going to hold off for next week because it made me really happy because there's one character that something happens to I am not a fan of mm, at all. Okay. And then the minute I heard this, I marked out. I'm going to save it for one week because I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to digest it because this is going to be a big, big book for Marvel. Obviously, they got everything going on with X of Swords, and 
whatever Donny Cates is doing is is always been money. And what he's done with Venom as a character, I'm very interested to read how this is all going to play out. But to flip the coin, though, to DC. Okay. Now, there are two books out that are really standing out. One is Justice League Endless Winter. So that's a big kickoff for the crossover that they had that panel for at New York Comic Con. Sounded very interesting. Justice League Vikings is the easiest way to describe it. And finally, hitting the shelves, Batman Catwoman number one. Fucking finally. Christ. Yes. It's it's out. It's black label. So I'm excited about that, Tom Christ, King. I've only been waiting for this for forever. Yeah. So Tom King is finally doing his swan song to his Batman story arc. Right. Love it or hate it. Uh, I'm personally a fan. I know it's kind of gone off the deep ends a couple times, but I've stayed with it thus far, so I can't complain about it. And I'm very excited to see how this is all going to play out. Mm-hmm. So definitely head over to your local comic shops, check it out, listen to your favorite comic podcast such as Cheers to Comics, uh, Wednesday Pull List, and a lot of great other ones that will be talking about this on their shows this week. So definitely want to catch up with Brian Wayne about this. Definitely want to talk to him about uh, King and Black. I definitely want to have a conversation with Brian about this. I know he listens to the show, so we'll be talking on Twitter about this as well. So that all being said, Pat, the music you heard on this episode of the ODPH is that of Shout at the Robots. They're a great band. I love those guys. They play phenomenal music. You hear them each week on the ODPH. They have a Patreon that they are definitely having a lot of great merch come out for it. We play a lot of the Shout of the Music or Shout of the Robots music because we were very big fans of them. But their merch, we've been showing a little bit on Instagram for it as well. So how do you find out about them, Pad? How do you find out? OchoZeroParleyHour.com. Yes, indeed. You head over to the music section. You check them out. You sign up for their Patreon. You tell them the ODPH sent you. They'll say thank you very much, and they'll let me know. And I'll be like, hey, thank you, too. And you also find out about great bands such as Second Suitor, who has just launched their merch store as well. So we got to get a link up for that. Uh, obviously, Brian Wolf, Fair City Fire, he's doing his live Patreon concerts every Wednesday. So as you hear this, definitely check it out. It'll be on his Facebook page. All those links to those great bands and so many more are on OchoDoroPolyHour.com's music section. But if you head over to the directory, you can find Friends of the Show. You can also check out Organizational Links Support and Black Lives Matter. You can also check out all the amazing pod groups we were in via their pod chaser pages. So we definitely want to shout them out we shout out pod nation we shout out the legion of independent podcast we shout out alternate reality radio we shout out the apocalypse who's having a pod raid with the house of indy this week and of course we shout out hashtag 607 podcast and our friends over at 8122 productions rich ron mike c and hashtag big nay cool still on twitter pad Uh oh so if you want to find out everything going on with them you head over to that section of the page and there is so much more coming out that i don't want to announce just yet so you got to stay tuned to OchoDoroParleyHour.com for all the latest. But we have some big moves coming in the month of January. So I'm just going to tease it like that and leave you hanging for more. So definitely, if you want to continue the conversation, join in on Twitter at ODParleyHour, and we'll definitely continue it from there. But that's all I got for this week. So for the one and only, Paddle one j hit him! 189 days, uh, still no HBO Max app on Roku. Nobody has the stats like Pad. Nobody. I'm your host, Ken Thank you, as always, for listening to the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Daryl Parlay Hour. See you next time.